All right. Is that good? maybe like one on? Does that have to be all of them? There's not a. Oh, I mean, if that's good, let's. Oh, there you go. There you go. A little dimmer. Yeah, just a little something, something. Yeah, that's perfect. Um. Okay, so hey everybody, my name is Kevin. Um, for those that don't know me, I have been in, in organic farming for the past like seven years. I started here in Florida, and then I moved around the country and around to other countries as well, farming and learning. So um, uh, I spent about four years in Oregon doing some or, uh, organic farming there and then moved back about two years ago to finally start my own farm and put all the things I've been learning into practice. So. Um, this, uh, this presentation is going to be strictly talking about water, as you can see. Um, I felt like it was a perfect time to talk about water because it's the end of the dry season and hopefully the rains will be here sooner rather than later. Um, so I figured I'd, I'd, st I'd start by talking about the concept of planting your water, which is uh, a concept that might be novel to some people. Um, but it's pretty basic in the sense that nature has been doing this for thousands and thousands of years. So I'm going to talk about how we can replicate uh, um, planting your water so that you don't have to rely uh, so much on your wells or on city water because uh, there may be in the near future some uh, issues with, with that, with those infrastructures. Um, so we'll go ahead and start. Um, I want to start off with a quote from Masanobu Fukuoka, Fukuoka, who's a pioneer in like um, the organic farming movement, at least the modern organic farming movement. He's a farmer in Japan who experimented with a lot of different styles of farming and kind of coined the term, at least there, uh, natural farming. So he says, it was in an American desert that I suddenly realized that rain does not fall from the heavens. It comes up from the ground. Desert formation is not due to the absence of rain, but the rain ceases to fall because the vegetation has disappeared. And that's the core principle of planting your water. So just to reiterate that, the rain, desert formation is not due to the absence of rain, but the rain ceases to fall because the vegetation has disappeared. So just keep that in mind as, as the presentation goes on because it's a principle that keeps coming up over and over and over again. So we're talking about water security here. And we're gonna start by defining what water security is. Kinda of hard to read that. Um, that's a pretty basic diagram of the different aspects of water security. What does water security mean in a society? It means that um, you have water for the environment, you share water for the environment, for the economic infrastructure. Um, you're secure, you're um, you're secure in terms of water whenever uh, disasters strike, like hurricanes or uh, wildfires. Um, so pretty much, is there enough water in the canals at the end of the dry season in case a big fire comes, uh, you know, happens in the estate or wherever and it keeps spreading? Do we have enough water to combat those kinds of things? Um, and urban, like city water and home water. In this so it's kind of... I kind of like it. it's a little basic diagram, but it does a good job sort of showing what water security is. But in our context, um, we have a very interesting context. I call it the drought and the deluge. So here in Florida, especially Southwest Florida, we have a monsoonal type of uh, climate where it's like uh, Dr. Jekyll and like Jekyll and Hyde, or like <laughs> it's just split. Two is it's six months of rain and six months of intense dryness. So it's a really challenging uh, climate to sort of, to grow one and then for, it just, it's just a challenging climate because we have to, um, so to put it simply, are we able to safely and effectively absorb and handle the water that comes down during the intense rainy season while at the same time safely and effectively utilizing our limited water resources during the intense dry season? In a nutshell, that's what water security here in 
Southwest Florida meet. Um, and why, why should we care about our water security? You know, we turn on tap and water comes out all the time, right? Um, there's no, here in the United States especially, I feel like we're a little disconnected with where our water comes from. I've traveled to different parts of the world and there's, I've been to many villages where, you know, running water is just simply not a thing. Like you either go to the local water source, haul buckets, bring it back to your house, use, you know, use that for your days of water or, there's just so many creative ways people all over the world handle water because um, water lines and faucets are a very novel thing for most people in the world. Um, so I love this kind of, I'm a big history nerd, so I love finding little things like this is a postcard from the early 1900s, I'm not sure when exactly, but this is um, White Sulphur Springs, Florida. Yeah, White, yeah, White Sulphur Springs. Um, it was a big tourist attraction back in the day. Um, people would bathe in there to, you know, uh, for its healing properties. Um, it was warm, you know, it was, a, it was a spring, so water was birthed from the ground and coming up. And it was a, it was a really big attraction. People loved it. Um, here's another picture of it back in the day. Um, um, and if you were to go there today, this is what it looks like. So wow. there's a exhibit A, <coughs> one of many examples. I don't have the time to go through every single example are uh, declining water, but this is one of them. So what happened was there was a phosphate mine nearby that pumped tons and tons of groundwater for the operation. And also the, the tourist bubble there kind of the tourism bubble there kind of like collapsed a little and just it, it kind of became a ghost town, I guess. Um, I'll have to constantly do this because for some reason it wants me to activate sticky keys. Um, so the phosphate mine <coughs> pumped and pumped and pumped and pumped and pumped until the water that was recharging in the aquifer that recharged the, the spring eventually just went kaput. So this is a uh, white spring today. Um, but well, that's White Springs, right? That's not Southwest Florida, that's Northern Florida somewhere. That doesn't affect us. But, uh, let's see here. Might have to have a little bit of a hook, but. Um, well, I guess I'll just have to improvise here and go back. Okay. Okay, that's a bummer. I wish that worked, but I guess it doesn't. Okay, so here are the signs that water is slowly but surely diminishing. So since the 1930s, 393 of Florida Springs are declining, including Silver Springs, which is a big famous spring, 30 to 40%. So there's another, you know, it's not just that one spring that went down, there's, it's a lot of springs. And then there was a big incident that happened, I think it was 2012. Drought has Cedar Key scrambling to provide fresh water. You can see um, Cedar Key residents and visitors pick up bottled water near the city's fire department. Salt water has infiltrated the community wells in a coastal community of Cedar Key, a result of the drought and a retreating aquifer. Residents and visitors are being told not to drink the water from the tap. So, this kind of stuff has happened, and I'm sure there's many more times where something like this happened and just didn't make the news. Um, so that's slightly concerning, you know? It's, at least for me, like I see this, and it's one thing to, it's one thing to watch the news and see it happen in Africa or Haiti or Honduras or any of these other countries, but um, you feel like a little removed from it. But when it's happening to communities that are in your state just a few hours away, sort of gives me a wake-up call at least um and here's another news article local wells dry up as groundwater drops looks like the jacksonville area no i don't want sticky keys um and yeah there's it and then we actually get closer to us 
This was 2017. It was a really, really dry year. That was the year of Hurricane Irma. So we had a pretty intense dry season, and then Hurricane Irma right after that. Um, Southwest Florida, so dry like canals, wells, pumps, lawn, water, and concerns. Nothing serious. It just says concerns, and obviously there's, there was still water in our landscape. Um, but then, this is the, that same year, 2017, drought dries up private wells in Fort Myers. Pe people in several Fort Myers neighborhoods are experiencing water shortages as the drought persists in Southwest Florida. So, it's affecting our community. We might not feel the brunt of it. I live in the estate, so historically it was a, a lot more spread out. People's houses were, you didn't feel the, 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 the damage of urbanization quite so much because you know we were out in the sticks back when I was a kid. Um, but places like Fort Myers and Cape Coral, they're starting to deal with this kind of stuff already. How, you know, it's a matter of time before the estates are going to start. Mm -hmm. My grandpa, he, he dug a well back in Miami. Uh -huh. He dug a well, but he dug it deeper. He got to dig deeper, 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 just in case. Just in case. Just in case the drought comes. So, like, I don't know how many feet. I think he dug, like, 30 feet deep. Yeah. Just in case. Some more, yeah. yeah. He was thinking ahead. That's... So, yeah. You know, there's a reporter for Waiting News. His name is Just in Case. <laughs> oh, yeah, there is. That's yeah. true. That's true. I've, I've actually not seen that. <laughs> That's funny. I'm glad you noticed that as well, right? Great minds think alike, I guess. Um, so Cape Coral homeowners dealing with dried up wells. I think this is that same year, 2017. Um, and it just goes to show Michael Hart has lived on well water in Northwest Cape Coral for 15 years. He never had a problem with his pressure going low until two weeks ago. Um, it just goes to show that it can happen to anyone, you know, at any time something like this no matter how long you've been living in that spot you know you could have been living there for 20 30 40 years and it you know if the conditions are right things like this can happen so he said we need to lower the pump down further we put it down to like 160 feet and so the job cost hard almost two thousand dollars a bill he never expected and certainly didn't budget for but looking around in this neighborhood Ariel Pisano from Water Medic of Cape Coral says Hart should have seen it coming thanks to all the new home construction. Every well that's drilled is like having a straw in a bowl. As more people move to Cape Coral, the water in that bowl disappears much faster. Um, and I'm just going to stop it there because the most important part of that sentence was you should have seen it coming thanks to all the new home construction. <laughs> What's going on in the estate right now? This exact story happened to us three weeks ago. Really? We had to go to 40 feet deep on our well to replace the pump $3,000. Oh, wow. Well, there you go. Plus water. Add that to the, to the next slide. Jeez. So there you go. It's That's creeping happening. in closer and closer and closer to our community. The canals are so dry. The canals are so dry. I drive by, what is it? Uh, it's the canals, like, the, the fish are like... <laughs> yeah, they're trying. So this is why I wanted to do it this time of year. Uh, when they asked me to talk, and it was in May, I was like, I have to talk about water, because May is one of our driest times of year. And this message will hit hard. So, I forgot to tell them if that doesn't work. And then here's just some more um, YouTube videos. I tried to look for, you know, positive news stories. I was like... Plenty of water, you know, wells are not drying up, like, and there was nothing. I tried my hardest, you know, I'm a positive person, I'm a very optimistic person, but I'm also a realist, realistic person that doesn't live in a delusional world, so. Um, and then here's more, and so here is um, our city planners, our, our local governments, this is their solution to our water, our water issue here in Fort Myers. They're spending more than how many thousand dollars to build even stronger pumps so that they can dig much, much deeper and provide water to people. It's, um, it's what I call a band-aid fix. Sure, you're, you're going to be able to supply the influx of people that are coming, but for how long? Right. And let's be, like, let's be real. And... Um, so that is the uh, their solution. Um, I think it's uh, very 
over-engineered uh, solution. I feel like there's so much more simpler solutions to this um, that put the power in the homeowners as opposed to the city planners, the engineers, whatever. It's stripping the power away from us and putting it into them. They're telling us not to waste water. We'll figure it out for you. I, that, that does not click with me. And then here we go, another one. So it, again, the only thing that they can do is find other places to pump water out of. And like I said, it does work, but for how much longer is this gonna work? And here's a little graph co compiled from um, five water districts in Florida um, about drinking water supply levels. You can see like in the Panhandle and places up there where there are the abundant natural springs, the freshwater springs, um, still, we're still good. The Orlando metro metropolitan area is definitely feeling it. And us down here, since we live in marshy, some you know, brackish water type ecology, we, since day one, have had a fragile freshwater system to begin with because we're so close to, you know, we're here where the Everglades is at, where it's um, sort of salt water and uh, freshwater co-mingle. Um, so yeah, so we're in that red and the red says not enough drinking water for current population due to over pumping, salt water intrusion and over development. Um, so the quantity is not the only problem. It's also the quality. So Florida drinking water rate second worst in nation. Really good a business for people like Culligan um, and Nestle and Bethany and all those people who do bottled water and purifying water. So they're having a grand old time. Um, so it's not just the quantity, it's also the quality of water. And this is our, uh, another very uh, modern man way of approaching problems is to just throw a lot of money in science and engineering into something which works a lot of the time, but for some things it's maybe not the best. So here's a wastewater treatment plant we have over 2,000 in the state. Um, because our water is so bad, we need to do something with the water for it it to be drinkable or usable at least so they so we pump it full of di different chemicals uh to treat it and then we'll re re recirculate it recirculate it back into the is it for drinking no i think it's for golf courses it's, yeah there you go oh Where did you say? it's for golf courses <laughs> oh, it's for um and here's another one this is lake okeechobee why florida's toxic algae crisis is worse than people realize Water data reveal how a devastating agricultural legacy aggravated by decades of political failure and now climate change has thwarted quests for solutions. So we have a big issue with Lake Okeechobee, which is, you know, the lifeblood of our, of our uh, watershed, at least starting from like, from Lake Okeechobee South. Um, the biggest lake here, like it's supposed to be the most amazing lake, right? Cause it's the biggest lake and unfortunately it's not. It's just a huge, nasty lake at this point, unfortunately. Um, and here's some more uh, news clips. This was in Lee County apparently, because right here's 239, it says Lee County Health Department. So you can see the toxic algae bloom that originated in Lake Okeechobee makes its way all the way down to all these different counties. And this was actually a sad story. I got choked up a little bit of um, this man who uh, does guided tours for fishing. Um, he said that year people were canceling left and right. He, and at the time of the interview, he said he already lost $20,000 worth of people scheduled, you know, um, that didn't want to do the guide to fishing tours because all the fish were just belly up, you know. And this is uh, the overflow of Lake Okeechobee um, coming into contact with the ocean. So sometimes, um, and this is another big problem that we have in Florida, is that all, a lot of our water infrastructure is uh, is rickety, old. It's not can't withstand the the, the, the pressure that we are putting it on on it uh, these days. It needs upgrading. So, um, and that's what's going on in Lake Okeechobee. The uh, the dams that are holding like the retaining walls of Lake Okeechobee are. Um, they're just not that great. So every now and then when the, when the waters get a little bit too high, um, we open up all the canals leading out of the Lake Okeechobee and discharge water 
from Lake Okeechobee so that um, it doesn't overflow and break the, uh, the dam. And so when we do that, which it's not all the time, it's only in state of emergency, this is what happened. It's it? very frequent. Oh, it is frequent? Oh, there you go. The captains for clean water are fighting that all the time. Because it, it, it creates dead zones go way out into the Gulf and almost down to the Keys. Mm. There you go. So and it's, a, it's actually too much water. Too much water, right? From, it from used Lake to flow all the way down through the Everglades, mm -hmm. and now it's dammed up there. Exactly. The agriculture. Exactly. And back in the 20s, a couple of hurricanes came and killed thousands of people in that lake. Overflowed, yep. Overflowed. Exactly. So now, now they kill the Gulf. Yeah, so it just goes to show that there's still an example of too much water. Yeah. <laughs> too much, and that's uh, that's Florida for you. There's a, and that's why the water security is both sides. You know, you have to absorb it and use it when we have too much, and utilize it uh, effectively when we don't have enough. Um, anything else I wanted to mention here? No, I think we're good. Um, so yeah, it's not hard to tell that we are, are have a declining quality of water. <coughs> You can read that for yourself. We top the list from all the, you know, polluted lakes. So you have thousands of acres that are impaired for swimming and wildlife. So many acres of estuaries are polluted. 1,700 impaired water bodies. Nearly 700 Florida's estimated 5,300 public water systems violate safe drinking water rules. So, this is what happens when you try to build a society on, on a swamp and don't do it correctly. So, what's the number one um, reason why we're having so much trouble? Uh, it stems from the relentless destruction of our natural hydrology. So, this is the classic water cycle that we all learned in grade school, right? It rains, the rain trickles, some of it percolates into the groundwater, which recharges the aquifer, which is the Florida, Florida, Florida aquifer system. It's one of the biggest ones here. Um, some of it goes down rivers, ends up in lakes, some of it in springs, um, goes through the wetlands and the estuary. And so it filters, this is all biological filters, mind you. It's filtering, it's slow, it's going left, it's going right, it's going this way, you know, animals are drinking it, people are bathing in it, whatever, boom, boom, boom. Until it finally reaches the Gulf of Mexico where it's uh, evaporated, uh, turned into clouds, and then turned into rain once again to start the cycle, whether it's to percolate into the groundwater to recharge our aquifer or to go down. So as a little thought experiment, I figured we, we could uh, sort of envision what it's like to be a water droplet, right? So we're up in central Florida somewhere where the springs are at. If you haven't been to the springs in central Florida, by the way, before they're all gone, I highly advise you to go because they're awesome. They're amazing. Crystal clear water manatees it's just an it's beautiful beautiful watch out for place. monkeys watch out for monkeys there's monkeys out there now yeah. for real yeah. that's hilarious you got loose uh, when you film tarzan gotta <laughs> <laughs> watch out we'll like attack you okay well noted okay so uh we're this water droplet trying to dodge monkeys in the spring um and so we so let me make this clear we uh, were birthed from the, from the ground, right? So we're coming up from the ground and now we're moving. We're, so we're in a spring, we came up out of the ground and we're flowing down one of the rivers and maybe, you know, there's a big, a big rain. We end up uh, crisscrossing, percolating through the oak hammock, which is a very typical biome of central Florida, very uh, famous for its, all the Spanish moss hanging now. Um, so we're trickling through the, the, the oak hammock, getting filtered each step of the way. We end up in Kissimmee, the chain of lakes. So we um, end up on this lake. We're, it's like a lazy river. We're going, we're going from one lake, depositing to another, depositing to another, depositing to another. And then maybe we get another rain or something. And then we finally end up in um, the Big Kahuna, Lake Okeechobee. Um, and maybe there's a big drought that year, you know, and, um, but it's okay because Mother Nature has systems in place to, to tolerate drought and to tolerate too much water. Because there are so many, like if you were to look back here, 
instead of having canals that just jut out to the ocean, we had lakes, bodies of water to, to move the water very, very slowly. So, so we're here now at Lake Okeechobee. Maybe it's an intense, intense, intense uh, dry season and we get evaporated into the, into the uh, air. Um, we move down a little south through the clouds and then we end up in the pine flatlands of, you know, here in the South Florida, which is, this is a very typical landscape here. Um, this is more of a drier area, so water uh, doesn't really retain much here. So we keep moving and uh, we're, we're moving and snaking our way through the pine flatlands, um, making our way here. Anybody know what this is right here? Yeah, that's a cypress dome. So then we finally go to a low spot. Everyone knows the cypress is a low spot and we make it to the land of the cypresses. And we're just hanging around with the alligators and the aningas and then we're we make it to the uh, prairies, the sawgrass prairies and sawgrass marshes um, with the beautiful say, palm thickets everywhere. And this entire time, remember, we're, we're, we're getting filtered, we're flowing, trickling, slow, having a grand old time. Um, we're getting closer to the coast, so then we come up to the coastal hammocks, which uh, are characterized with this tree right here. Anyone know what this tree is? Gumbo yeah, gumbo limbo, tourist, tourist tree. tree. Yep, because it's red and peeling. Um, <laughs> so, and again, look at those roots. You think water's just flowing through? No, we have to go around the roots and and there's all that organic matter on the ground. Nature's mulch, you know. And uh, so we're at the we're at the ocean. We're, we're getting close to the ocean. What more could there possibly be, right? What about huge thickets of sea grape? Have you guys ever been in the sea grape forest in the in the beach? It's amazing. It's, it's crazy to see that there's a forest environment right on the beach. But that's because nature has the systems in place to, to help not only help uh, <coughs> water slow down going into the coast, but also when we have crazy storms and hurricanes, water is coming from the coast. So what more could there possibly be? We're literally right next to the ocean. Of course, the last line of defense the almighty, not the almighty uh, excavators, <laughs> the almighty mangroves, exactly. That's the last filter that nature has in place to, to slow down water from going inland out to the coast. And as we all know, from the coast coming inland, as we all learned firsthand last year. Um, so what happens when we Okay, well actually, I skipped ahead here. We finally make it to the coast in the ocean to get evaporated and then to turn into rain, which then falls, recharging the aquifer once again to the place that we were born. So that was historically what water's journey was in Florida. Um, but what happens when we replace the... Uh, that elaborate, intricate filtering system with uh, concrete. You get this. Does that look <clears throat> water secure? Does that look like water is uh, percolating through and going slowly into the coast? Or does it look like it's just washing off the pavement and going straight into the coast? Probably the latter. And what happens if you replace it with this? Does that look like uh, water is seeping slowly and hanging out and hanging around? Or does that look like it's just gonna run off? Probably the latter. And we can go on about it and keep going on. Actually, there's another photo of a, I guess not. Uh, so in the name of progress, we've destroyed a lot of the Earth's ecosystem, but in specific with Florida, we're talking about Florida here. Almost half of the Florida's wetlands are gone. By 2060, it's predicted that a third of Florida could be paved over. So what does that mean? What does that mean if in 2060, a third of Florida would be paved over? Does that mean uh, with the first time it rains after a long dry season that we might end up looking something like this? Maybe. This was April 12th of this year. <clears throat> This was when Fort Lauderdale got the first major rains. So what happens is, 
the soil becomes hydrophobic after a long time of no rain. It heats up and um, soil can't really retain moisture when it's too hot. It needs to cool down, it needs to be the same temperature as the water falling for it to actually retain the moisture. So, you know, those first rains are kind of some of the most dangerous because the, the soil cannot hold it. So it's just going to the path of least resistance, which in many cases is a city in the middle of the road. So again, I asked this question, does this look like it's passing the water security test? So again, at the heart of the problem is over extraction, quite simply. Too many people taking too much water from the aquifer um, and the demands are increasing. So Florida's population could increase 75% by 27. That means another 15 million new residents and a 53.7 increase in demand for water. But not only that, not residents. In addition, in 2019, Florida attracted a record of 131.4 million travelers. And what time of year do the do uh, most of the tourists come? There you go. This is uh, <coughs> kind of pretty much something that everyone knows. We just do waste a lot of water. I thought it was kind of funny the state's number one cloud grassy ones. So what does this mean? A depletion of the aquifer's uh, water levels brings the danger of saltwater intrusion, which we talked about before. Beneath the Florida, Florida and aquifer is an ancient saltwater sea pushing upward, but it's held in check by that fresh water above it. It's a big freshwater mass, which is the aquifer. Over extraction and diminishing recharge are weakening the freshwater lens and allowing saltwater to rise and seep into the aquifer at levels that make its water undrinkable. If freshwater levels in the Florida and aquifer continue to fall, the main source of usable water in Florida could be contaminated. Obviously, the consequences could be devastating. So that's, this is a really good diagram showing um, what happens uh, if we keep installing those big, huge pumps and keep going down deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Well, eventually, we're going to be uh, brushing our teeth with ocean water, so. Not a good plan. And. The unfortunate thing is, is that, you know, we're even us, just us living normal lives are in, uh, adding to this. Just having a septic tank. You know when you guys have a septic tank and it's a dry season, you don't have water, but somehow there's like a green patch above your septic tank? Yeah, so that's just very, to put it in nice terms, nutrient-rich water um, <laughs> kind of percolating back up and the grasses and stuff are feeding from, from that. So if that's happening, Imagine what's happening down below. And this is a really nice diagram showing exactly what happens. Um, so um, this is the same water that we're pumping up to, to use, you know? So just think about it. It's each time you flush the toilet, this is kind of what's happening. Um, which it isn't a big deal back in the day when there was like one house for every, however many, you know, square miles but it becomes a deal when you start stacking houses one on top of the other, on top of the other, on top of the other. And then a big, a, another big uh, influence here is uh, rainwater, uh, storm, storm water. So what happens when, when we have big, heavy rain, all that stuff, um, and it goes down the drain, and instead of percolating like it should, it goes straight into the body of the water. Um, so. And just another little uh, map here showing how many wastewater treatment, treatment sites we have. Um, and yeah, that's just, just gonna leave it at that, okay? So you tell me, does Florida pass a water security test? Yay or nay? No. No, 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 no. All right. So the good news is that the depressing part is over. Um, we, could actually not, you know, now that we can see the writing on the wall, we can at least prepare for it. We can at least do something, do things on our properties in our households so that if one day you, we, we turn on the sprinklers to water our plants and out comes salt water and all the plants die, that doesn't happen because we have other options of watering um, primarily through through the capturing of rainwater 
in, in a couple different ways. So the most common one that people think of is using modern infrastructure to harvest rainwater, i.e. rain water tanks. And I'm going to save that for last because that's not really what I want to talk about. You know, you can, there's many YouTube videos on how to, how to put up rainwater tanks. I want us to get into the mind frame of how do you utilize the, your property and your plants on your property uh, as a form of harvesting rainwater. Because if you think about it, plants with roots, they're pretty much just like biological pumps. They're getting water from down below, bringing it up, bringing it down. So we need to be thinking, how do we, how do we keep the water on our property and use it in an effective manner instead of, which is most people's, uh, most people's um, kind of first thought is when we, whenever we have too much water, is to just drain it away from our landscape as quickly as possible. Because rightfully so, it, it disrupts you know modern life. You can't drive on. You ever hydroplane this? Whew, that's scary. Um, so, how do we utilize our landscapes to recreate that amazing um, system that nature has to slow and triple water and uh, reuptake it into plants. So that's what I'm going to be talking about mostly because that's the first thing we should think about. Um, and then secondly, we should think about the rainwater tanks and all this. Because what good does it do if you set up this crazy, amazing, elaborate rainwater tank system with thousands and thousands of gallons and this filter and that filter if when you use it to irrigate your plants, the water that you use, it's just all going away from the property. So let's think about this first and then we'll think about that second. So the concept of planting your water. So this is my property here. This is my fruit forest. Um, and this is my neighbor's property. If we had an intense downpour right now, um, how, who, whose property do you think is gonna capture much more of that water and have less of it drain off? Obviously mine because there's so much going on and there's so much organic matter on the ground. There's trees, there's trees that break it. First of all, the trees break up the water droplets so they don't just crash them down. And second of all, there's so many different layers in there that a lot of that water is getting absorbed by roots, getting absorbed by plants, getting absorbed by everything before it even starts thinking about leaving my, my water, my system. So the number one key is this is the best bang for your buck. This is the most basic thing you can do to your property. Organic matter all the way. For most of us, that comes in the form of mulch. And if you're as lucky, if you're lucky enough to be that guy, then kudos to you because <laughs> you can get a lot done with that, with that amount of mulch. Um, so organic matter is one of the most important things we can do on our landscapes. Whether it comes in the form of mulch, whether it comes in the form of palm fronds, people, you know, put palm fronds in bags and put them in the front yard for it to get shipped away. Mm -hmm. That's the thing, when you hear this kind of paper bags, you know where your own stuff. You just, <laughs> what, what I've been doing, I've been burying my palm fronds and all that, and then uh, what I do is I buy like one, like one bag of mulch, mm -hmm. um, and then I'll just pretty much make a pile of all the crap and just put the mulch of, of one bag of topsoil and then mulch. Yeah, exactly. And that yeah. is a, that's a battery pack right there yeah, of yeah. water retention. So that's something I was, I was going to talk about. Money on bags. Exactly. Yeah. So why is organic matter important? We all know, we all heard that mulch is good, but why? Why is it important? It's not so much the mulch itself. It's what happens once you start putting mulch down on your property. So this is uh, one of my newest projects that I'm working on for a client. Um, and this is, we haven't even thought about planting a thing yet because I don't plant anything unless the property is looking like this. Unless the, I know that the plants have an environment where they're not gonna get flooded out, they're not gonna get over, uh, like dry from the drought. I don't even think about planting things until um, there's just a humongous sponge of organic matter there. So, um, and you can see some very beautiful, it's just something I also talk about, um, leaning into your landscapes, planting things close to things that are already established. There's a big, huge salt palmetto patch right here and another one right here. 
which creates a nice microclimate for any other plant that you're gonna put there. So that's why we chose that spot because it was just nestled nicely in, in between two soft palmetto patches. But anyways, um, so. How thick do you make your bowl? The more the better, as really high like as possible. Four inches? I, so I, I don't measure, I just go until I run out. I go at least a foot. At least a foot, because after one rainy season, that foot is gonna turn back down to four inches. So the more, the better. There, there, there's no such thing as too much mulch, okay? Like, it doesn't have to be around your the plant that you want. It could be all around, because think about it. Tree roots don't just go straight down. They go left, right. They go everywhere. So if you have mulch, a big, huge mulch ring around a tree, like many feet away those that tree that you plant is still going to tap into that mulch no matter what because it you know tree roots they spread so um so it's not so much the mulch itself it's what's going on under the mulch and this is one of the most crucial things to know whenever you're applying mulch this is what's happening so my ceiling my horizon and the wood wide web anybody heard the wood wide web that term <laughs> so um, we'll get into what the wood wide web is in a bit, but um, this is this is what is the real deal here. It's not the mulch. The mulch is just the vector for this to happen. Fungus. We need to partner with fungus so that we could mitigate our water issues. So what does fungus do? What do these fungi do? So, fungi have a symbiotic relationship with tree roots and plant roots. Um, so this is this is a nice little diagram I found. They're really cool looking. So, um, when fungi grow in the forest, they send out tiny, often microscopic fungal filaments called hyphae into the soil. These hyphae intertwine with the roots of trees and plants to create an underground network called a mycorrhiza. And that's where the wood wide web comes into play. It's an underground network where fungi and plants connect with each other and they're able to send everything, whether it be messages like, oh crap, we just got browsed on by a deer. Everyone, make sure you're... Um, your, your plant hormones are, are in check. Or, oh wow, hey, I'm feeling sick. Could somebody send me some potassium and some nitrogen over here? That is what this, uh, the mycorrhiza do. They're the um, connectors between plants. So here's how the symbiotic relationship works. The trees photosynthesize and they uh, create <clears throat> energy, including carbon-rich sugar molecules by using the power of the sun via photosynthesis, and then they break it down, and then the fungi receive these sugars, and when the sugars reach the mycorrhiza, the fungi consume about 30% of the fuel. This is the price the trees must pay to be part of the network, okay? And then in return, the trees receive nutrients. In exchange for the sugar, the fungi gather nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen from the soil and deliver them back to the trees. So if you have this thick mat of mulch and the fungus start moving in and you have trees that maybe you, you've been trying to water for so much and it's just still not doing anything. Well, maybe the watering wasn't the issue. Maybe it just had no food, nothing, there was no nutrients going to it. And it's crazy how you'll start to see results pretty quickly once you start mulching very heavily because, because of the wood wide web. And what does that result in? It results in less watering. The, the trees and the plants, they've got their bases covered. They don't need as much water whenever they have everything else around them going, going well. Um, and it's not only nutrients that they, <clears throat> they pass on uh, to each other. It's also, it's also sticky keys apparently. Okay, um, so things like, uh, Baby, baby trees that are coming up under mother trees, um, sometimes uh, a lot of that shade is detrimental to the baby trees. So what happens is the mother trees will give them nutrients 
through the through the wood wide web through the mycorrhizal network um, because they know that they're they're under a little bit too much shade right now, so they're protecting the the baby trees because what happens if a lightning strike hits this or a hurricane topples this over? We need the next generation to come through, you know. So that is why uh, these plants are connected in the mycorrhizal network because they're all looking out for each other. They're they're trying to have the whole ecosystem as a whole thrive, not just the one plant. And so here, dying trees as well, disease and dying trees, they'll dump all of their energy and nutrients into the network so that, because um, they know they're on their way out. So they'll just do, uh, they'll give, they'll spread the love to everyone else that needs it. And then distressed trees, like I said, when they're under attack, they send the warning signals to the rest of the people. And this is all happening because of the fungus. Um, so the nets, so we have the mulch, and we have the uh, you have your you know your target plants. You put the mulch down, um, and now you have to start. You, the fungus are coming in, and the wood the wood wide web is starting to develop. But what good does it have? But what good does it do if you only have one tree here? I included this picture because it's kind of what I'm trying to talk about. One tree here, and then maybe just another tree here, and another tree here, and then tons of mulch, and that's it. Well, it's gonna it's a lot of room in between these you know these trees. You need to be able to, you need as much roots as you can in the ground. You need to fill the distance from here to here with as many roots as possible so that the, the mycorrhizal can make the connections all the way through. So you want, the, you want your root systems to be looking like this. Think about it. Think about how much water could be stored in the root systems of, of, a, of an ecosystem like this. Instead of it just washing away, it trickles down and it seeps into your landscape. And everyone gets a piece of that pie, that water pie. Like, it doesn't just leave. So roots in the ground are very, very, very crucial when you when you work with mulch. A lot of people just think, oh, I finally got the mulch. You know, the tree guy finally came. Um, I'm just gonna lay it down, and then you know, magic's gonna happen. And some magic happens, but people oftentimes forget that the roots in the ground are very, very, very important. So that the roots actually work the soil, work the mulch, and turn it into soil. And yes, even if that's torpedo grass roots. Anybody have the experience here of getting mulch dumped in the property? And this is another mistake people do. They just leave the mulch pile to sit. As soon as you get that mulch pile, you want to use it. That's when it's most alive. That's when things are happening. That's when uh, it's just, it's starting to break down and the party's going on. So if you just leave a mulch pile to be sitting and you're not doing anything with it, nature is waiting for you to put the roots in, right? And if you don't hurry up and put roots in, it's gonna put the roots in, because we need the roots for the wood wide web, remember. Um, and nature's, uh, um, nature's first uh, first pick is uh, <laughs> torpedo grass, unfortunately. It could be a pain in the butt, but it's serving a bigger function in the ecosystem by connecting um, trees to other trees and plants to other plants. Um, ideally, you use edible medicinal sprawling ground covers with my favorite being uh, sweet potato. This is at your house in Naylor when we, uh, this, you stuck that sweet potato in the ground, in the yeah. mulch pile? So this mulch pile was uh, just sitting there and Danielle stuck a sweet potato on top just to see what happened. You just stuck it there? Yes. Yeah. And now I have actually the sweet potato when I'm taking the mulch, put it Yeah, it. so now you have free sweet potatoes? I, I have a lot. There you go. And purple, and purple sweet potatoes. Amazing. So, so see what happens when you beat Mother Nature to the punch and you put what you want in there? You get free sweet potatoes by accident. Um, so you can see my, one of my favorites is sweet potato because it will just take over and cover that mulch. That's what you need is to cover that mulch. And here you can see the, um, the sweet potato and the, and the torpedo grass are both. Turmeric? Oh yeah, these are all turmeric. Yeah, I'm primarily a turmeric farm, so okay. yeah, so that's 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 one of my patches. Um, I also brought it's turmeric planting season, so I brought a lot of turmeric. Is it? Um, I sell it uh, for five bucks a one of the pints. So yeah. and they're all sprouting now. So um, we'll get to that later. So <clears throat> incorporating ground cover species is the fastest way to not only spread the root activity throughout the land. But it's the fastest way to cover and shade your mulch, a crucial yet often overlooked aspect. 
It helps prevent the evaporation and keeps the soil cool. So a lot of people just put the mulch down and think that's all. That's the tip of the iceberg. You need to do a lot more to the mulch. You need to put plants in it, put roots in it, and shade it as much as you possibly can. Cover it with sweet potato, cover it with something. Because what happens is <clears throat> the sun just starts to bake it and crispify that mulch layers. Sometimes you'll like try to dig through the mulch, but it's just like crusted on. Is because that sun, it, you know, Florida sun's brutal. It's uh, no secret that Florida sun is brutal. Um, so you want to protect that mulch as much as possible. And sweet potatoes are personally my favorite way to do it. But there are also other alternatives um, that you can look up on the internet. So, so you're saying, so you're saying you, you, want, you should plant the sweet potatoes in the mulch. In the mulch. They, they love it. They don't need soil. There's, there's, there's a, that's why I love planting sweet potatoes. So let me go back. No, that's, I just want to make that clear because that is something I wanted to talk about. You, can, you don't need any soil to plant sweet potatoes. If you buy sweet potatoes from the store and just, and just get them a mulch pile and just put it in the mulch pile, pretty soon you're going to have sweet potatoes coming out of that mulch pile. So kind of just to think about planting in a different way, you don't need to dig into the soil sometimes for certain plants. And that's a you know, topic for another time. Um, but sweet potatoes is definitely one that you can just stick under some mulch and before you know it, you're going to have sweet potatoes everywhere. Or like, like you said, where you put the, um, you just put all the, all the debris, the yard debris and stuff. If you bury some sweet potatoes around there, they're all, they're going to take over that, that thing and they're going to, they're going to actually push it down and actually make soil through it. So it's a way to accelerate everything. So that's why I love sweet potatoes because they accelerate the decomposition process like nobody's business. So. So you got the mulch, you got the fungus, you got the, the living roots everywhere, and you got the shade. All that combines to the arthropod party. And these are the hardest workers that we have here in terms of soil fertility and in terms of holding in that moisture. So <clears throat> millipedes, baby millipedes, snails, cockroaches, pill bugs, these are all arthropods. What does that mean? It means that they, they have an exoskeleton, right? And uh, why are arthropod exoskeletons so important? Nitrogen. Many things. So everyone, do, does anybody is familiar with crab meal? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's one of the things that a lot of the organic gardeners here absolutely love here in Florida because it, um, it has calcium carbonate, and also has chitin. Um, this is what's in arthropod uh, exoskeletons. Calcium carbon is a very important for nutrient, very important nutrient for plant life, and chitin is kind of the most important part here in Florida because it helps prevent root knot nematodes. Chitin is known to help prevent root knot nematodes, so that's why everyone loves crab meal here in Florida because it helps to you sprinkle some of that and it helps to prevent root knot nematodes, which we are plagued with here in Florida. So if I bury like old dead mushrooms. Yeah, the mushrooms from Russell's plate? Yeah. yeah, dude, before you know it, you're gonna have. Cause I'm already, I got so much out of them. So. <laughs> I'm throwing them on the Yeah, you bury them. And then pretty soon you're gonna have this. This is, this is what, this is one of Russell's mushroom blocks. Oh, okay. Look at, this is a, a nursery for, this is all baby millipedes. Baby crawlies. Yeah. But we need the baby crawlies, cause what, what do they do? They, they live their lives down in that, in that mulch. They live, they die, they pee, they poop, they shed their exoskeletons, and their ex why? Are, why would we pay? I don't. I never pay. I never pay for that crab meal stuff. But I'm pretty sure it's not the cheapest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. I went to a talk and they were telling me um, uh, drywall. Okay. Drywall breaking up drywall. Drywall. Calcium carbonate. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's. But not the one from China. The one from China has cadmium. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, I, I'm gonna stick to the millipedes, but if you wanna, <laughs> hey, I mean, it's, it's all the experiments. I'm down for experimenting, you know? I just, I got a good thing going on with the millipedes, so I'm gonna, you know, stick with this. Um, so this is another thing I wanted to bring up. It's not just the calcium carbonate and this and that, there. it's, these are animals. You know what animals do? They pee, they urinate. You know, you know what urination is? It's liquid. Right. It's liquid nitrogen. 
but emphasis on the word liquid, okay? It's a form of? Water. Exactly. When you have an abundance of micro, of, of soil life in there, you have tiny, tiny, tiny little micro drip irrigation going on all over your landscape. So if you really, 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 really intensely go hard on your mulch and like get as much organic matter on the ground as possible, then you're gonna have these critters start to move in. Um, if you don't like these critters, then maybe you can have your garden a little, this experimental plot a little farther away from your house so you don't have to run into them. But these, they're literally everywhere on, on my food forest. They are everywhere. I can't take, hardly take a step. Usually when I first started, I just, I had to dig and then find them. Now, especially in the morning when I have my headlamp, they're up and around. They're out on the banana trees. They're like in the trees now. I've never seen that in other people's properties where they're not just in the ground anymore. They're like, they got a little too comfortable, you know? They're, they're starting to go everywhere. But that's exactly what I want. They're in my house, so. Yeah, yeah. and that's a big, that's the problem. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that is, a, that is a problem. Unfortunately for me, it, that hasn't happened yet, but I've seen it at other people's houses. It's, it can get pretty bad. So let's think about not having to rely on the store for things. You know, this goes beyond water. It goes also into fertilizer. It goes also into, into shade. You know, why would, why would you, there are certain things that you don't need to buy at the store. You can, with a little bit of creativity and some thinking, you can do it at, with the things that are around you. Um, one of my favorites, just talking about shade, is cabbage palm leaves. I like to, um, whenever I plant a baby tree and it looks like there's a lot of sun, maybe I'm gonna be awake so that I travel a lot. Um, I, I get, I cut down like four or five cabbage palm leaves and I make like a, a little shelter around it. Okay, so then um, when I'm gone and the sun's out, it's not cooking that little baby tree. I have a little bit of a, um, a little house around it um, and it reduces my watering. I just need to water once sometimes, you know. Obviously I have amazing mulch and soil and everything, so. That's just a, a little tip that I love to do is utilize cabbage palms. Because if you think about the natives here, how do they make their, uh, their roofs with the cabbage palm leaves? So utilize cabbage palms to your advantage. So don't underestimate the power of organic matter. And you don't have to, you know, get the big sexy mulch pile. You can start with the things that are on your property already. Like you said, just pile up palm fronds on one spot. Say you want to plant something here one day, you're just not sure yet. Just keep piling stuff on. Pile, 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 pile your pine cone, pile, just make a huge pile. Plant some sweet potatoes around it. Plant, do something with that spot. In six months, this is gonna have a lot more water retention, a lot more fertility, just a lot more life. The, the plant that you put here is probably gonna be a lot happier than the plant that you put over here or wherever. So don't underestimate the power of organic matter and don't think that you have to have the big fancy uh, mulch trucks come deliver at your property because you don't. You have plenty of organic matter there. Um, seeds are your friends, especially beans. So you don't see the beans in there because I'm not sure why, but this is beans. <clears throat> Seeds are amazing. They're amazing tools for, for designing your landscape to be more water resilient. And especially beans, because beans are fibaceous. And you know what fibaceous plants do? They fix nitrogen. They have a symbiotic relationship with certain bacteria that take nitrogen in the air, because <coughs> nitrogen is literally like 70% nitrogen in the air, but it's rendered unusable to plants from to most plants except for beans beans have the symbiotic relationship with the bacteria that helps them take nitrogen from the atmosphere put it down into the roots and spread it through the wood wide web so if you have the mulch the uh, roots the the arthropods the shade and then you add beans to the mix I mean, it's the recipe for success, you know? Just think of how many things we're stacking here. Every time we stack one more thing, it's one less water requirement that we need. Because we're, we're pumping nitrogen into the ground through the usage of these beans, these seeds. One of my favorite being jack beans. 
an amazing, amazing, amazing plant. I can't speak about it like I just can't give it more praise because I love this 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 uh this plant. They're called jack beans. I actually bought some. I'll have some for sale. They're one of my favorite uh, beans. So they they produce big long uh, seed pods. They're only edible like when they're young and um, young tender seed pods and if you do want to eat them when they're at this stage, you have to do some processing. So it's not it's not much of an edible species, but it is edible to the rest of your plants. So if you plant this, say you have 20 trees on your property, if you plant four jack beans around each tree, each one of those 20 trees are gonna, you'll see, I wish I had a picture. Um, I, I have an, uh, a regeneration project in Honduras on my family land. So we're, we're, you know, we're putting these principles into action over there and uh, um, regenerating some degraded land. Um, and you can see the avocados that I planted just by themselves with no jack beans, kind of look frail and spindly. You know, I don't use any irrigation out there. And then the avocados that I have with the, the jack beans next to it, you, they're just beautiful, lush, new growth. So you can just, you know, I hesitate to, to speak on things until I've seen them. So you can plant them around? Around, yeah, right next to around, you know. Just plant, plants want to be with other plants. They stay low? They stay, they, they stay low, but every once in a while they'll, they'll, they like to climb. But it's not like, it's not like a, those, yard long beans where they climb everything. everything. They're kind of like a, a hybrid. Some of them stay and never climb, but then one er, out of every five or ten seeds is a climber. So just genetic variability maybe. Pigeon pea is another amazing one. Um, cow peas. This is stuff that you can get at the at Publix or at the Hispanic uh, grocery stores. Like this is another amazing one called Sun Hemp. I didn't have I was I didn't have time to package these seeds, so sorry. I was, what was that one? Sun hemp. Yeah, this is amazing, an amazing one. And then moringa is also an amazing one. So, plant seeds. You know, don't don't rely on the on nurseries to get plants. You can go to Publix, uh, and go to their, their their bean aisle, and you have thousands of plants just sitting on the shelf waiting to for them to be planted for three bucks. Dry, the dry bags, dry bags? Yeah, the dry bags, yep. Um, okay. Fix that nitrogen. So this is the jack beans right here. You can see how lush and green they're on it. Their, their foliage is. Um, this is a baby, <clears throat> baby jack bean. Um, so this is the cow peas. I went to Publix, I got a bag of cow peas. I planted this. This is my focus right here, right? This banana. But why would I just plant the banana when I can plant so many friends for it, you know? So I, I literally just got a, a full of the, of the cow peas and I went like this. <laughs> it's, that's all it takes. And then put some mulch on, a little bit of mulch on top of it and then it, it comes up through the mulch. Um, and, then, and then look at that. That's, that banana looks like a happy banana because it has all its bean friends around. And there's no weeds. There's, there's no tapiti grass in there. The yeah, yeah, definitely. The cow, peas? the cow peas, you can eat them young. Yeah, I eat them. I don't, I don't. Even you can eat the dried ones. You yeah. To cook them, Ex just boil them, mm -hmm. and then saute them with onions and stuff. Exactly. Yeah, you can eat them too. Okay. Um, I like to, I like to eat them young though in this system because I, I'm not going to wait for them to get ripe and then try bean. to, I don't have the time to, as to, green as a green bean, yeah, as a green bean you should. And, and the jack bean too? The jack bean is a little tricky. You can eat it at this stage. It's still flat. Yeah, exactly. You just got to cook it good. Um, if you don't, it's like the baba bean and use it for houses. Um, <laughs> there, I think there is some mild toxicity to it. If you have to be careful with the jack bean. Like I said, I personally have not eaten it because I'm just, I just haven't tried it yet. But from what I've understood, it's okay. You can eat it like this and you can, if you, if you soak the, the mature beans and then like change the water out and soak it again and then make sure you boil it for a long time, I think you're, you'll be fine, you know? But it's just, no, I, it's just not something. This is sun hemp. But this is after probably like three months of growth. One time. Three months? Uh-huh. Wow. Yeah, it's, and there's tiny seeds you could put a lot of them. So that's another way to reduce water needs because you're pumping nitrogen everywhere. So now we're gonna get into the concept of uh, Planting biotic pumps. 
I'm gonna put some more in there. Water bottle around there. Hold on. I need a little bit of water. It might be in here. Oh no. Might be over there. That's the mic. Okay. Oh yeah, there's a black one, yep. Thank you. Okay, and now we're gonna talk about the concept of biotic pumps or biological pumps. Thank you. So A pump is something that takes water from one place and moves it, right? And pretty much every single plant in this world is a biotic pump, but some plants do it better than others with, I'd say the, I'd say the most, um, the, the best example of a biotic pump is a cactus. The saguaro cactus this is a majestic saguaro cactus in the deserts of the South Southwest America. So what, is, what does this do? So it doesn't rain much in the desert, right? So what cacti do is that with their needles, the thousands and thousands of little needles, every morning when, the dew, when there's dew droplets, they collect all that dew and then they bring it into themselves and they store it in their water tank. They're just big water tanks pretty much. Look at it like that. That's what cactus, cacti are. So cacti are probably the best of plants represent what a biotic pump is because they don't need much water at all. When was the last time you heard somebody say, oh, I need to water my cactus more? <laughs> Never. So lean into those cac to the cacti, the succulents, the yuccas, which I'll get to. Moringa, which is like a, a, a dry limb tree. Obviously the native plants in this area. And then, so I'll get into those in a bit. So first and foremost, the natives, you can never go wrong with planting natives. They're the ones that have been here longer than you know anyone. So they know what to do in this landscape, you know. And if you get if you don't if you can't find a resource to plant them, take care of the ones that are already on your on your property. Please don't don't just uh, if you're looking for an area to clear to plant some fruit trees, don't just level that whole thing and, and start from scratch. Work around the existing native vegetation because their roots this this. This, these three cabbage palms right here, the amount of water that they're holding in their roots right here, whatever you plant around them, they're gonna tap into that water reservoir right there. If you were to take these trees out because you don't like the look of them in your food forest, then you're gonna have to water a lot more because you just took out this amazing water reservoir with our in their roots. Yeah, I do have a problem with them. They go into where the trees are, uh -huh. and you know, the roots are everywhere. From those palms. Yeah. So I think they're stealing the nutrients from my tree. Um, <laughs> I personally haven't had any negative experiences with uh, with cabbage palms. I've planted stuff close to cabbage palms and um, haven't seen anything. But then again, I'm pumping the system with so much. In. I think when you have an abundance of fertility, it doesn't matter. They're, you know, they're. They're, they're sharing, if anything, they're sharing. Maybe it's just a fertility problem somewhere else. Yeah, I, I bring uh, like a truckload of mm -hmm. dirt, good dirt. And even if one of those is about 25, 30 feet away, you can find the roots in, the, in that pile of dirt. Yeah, for sure, that's what roots do. You can go that far. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that, that's, that's good. That's, that means the roots are working. <laughs> they're doing their job. <laughs> Uh, I personally haven't seen. I would like to. See. Yeah. Damn, that's crazy. I would like to. That would, that would probably make digging a chore, though. It's not the easiest thing in the world to dig through your farm. There's a wind or a storm. There's thousands of fronds on top. All right, so maybe there's a selective thing you can do. Um, I grind them. I have. Yeah, the grinder. Yeah. That's good. That's probably the best thing you can do for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The baby ones. If you already have so many established ones, they yeah, use the baby. Them in the year, yeah, you cut them and use and utilize them. Um, just don't, just don't try not to clear cut them. No, you know, no, no. you know what I'm saying. Um, but I would love to see. I would love to see that because you know I don't want to. I don't want to lead anybody in the wrong direction. But from what I've seen on my property, the cabbage palms. There aren't very. They're not the oldest cabbage palms in the world, so maybe that's a, a factor. But um. But either way, the natives, they're, they're, they're helping regulate some of that water to, to, um, 
to be able to be used throughout the landscape. Um, cactus, the prickly pear cactus, you can find this everywhere. If you just stop along the street somewhere, I'm sure, I'm sure you'll find a wild patch of it somewhere. Um, and if not, then reach out to friends. This is a very good species to have. Like I said, they're a cactus. They, they like to grow in this um, in this environment. Huh? Yeah, you can you can eat them. Yeah, nobalas. Yeah, you can definitely eat nobalas. They're really, I like them. Um, so any any plant that you plant close to this, like I said, is going to have this whole sort of a kind of water reservoir here to to tap into as well. They actually the roots actually actively release water. Yeah, exactly. They call it hydraulic redistribution. There you go. Some plants do like prickly pear. Like prickly pear. And furthermore, what I do with the prickly pear, because I have a lot, I actually cut a lot of them and then I chop them up real nice and fine and use that as a as a as a fertilizer. And it, it's like a slow drip gel that that the, the, the soil life absolutely love. So it's something I do with a lot of plants, not just prickly pear. I do it with what would you plant next Anything. Anything. Anything you want. Yeah, yeah. And make sure to try to get the, the, the spineless varieties. It makes it easier to, to walk around in. Um, because there are spine spiny varieties. I try not to work too much with those. I'm just using it as an example. But I love the spineless varieties. I have those everywhere. <clears throat> um, another thing is... Uh, the columnar cactus, I got this from, uh, from your, I got inspiration from your poverty because uh, cause of the columnar cactus that's there. So um, these do have spines. Um, there are spineless varieties too. I just haven't come across too many spineless ones yet. Um, but this is another example of a, uh, of a just a beautiful Peruvian apple. So I, it's the same, it's the same genus, Sirius. I'm not sure which one's which. I'm not too uh, keyed into my uh, cacti botany. I'm pretty sure you guys have this one. Yeah. Just flowers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so. Close to the evening. I was thinking they were. <coughs> yeah, that might be close to the evening. I'm not sure how they did that photo. Um, might be early, early, early morning or something. Yeah. Like before nine. Oh, they open up. Oh, okay. So early morning then is probably what's going on there. Um, so, you know where to get a cutting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <clears throat> aloe vera is another one. It's a, and now we're going into the realm of succulents. I'm kind of going in the order of things that you don't need a lot of water to get started. You can literally plant a, one of those uh, prickly pears in the middle of the dry season with no water, and it will survive. They're magical. And, you know, they might look rough for the, for the beginning, but it'll eventually make it through, especially when they're thicker. So another key note, uh, key thing to note whenever you're planting cactus is don't go for the little, the little ones. Go for the big ones, the big juicy ones that already have babies coming out because that's the ones that, and that goes for any plant that you get vegetatively. It's going to be harder for you to try to make a little baby plant grow than, a, you know, a nice, meaty, you know, nice, nice plant that has a lot of energy in it um so aloe vera is another beautiful one because it's a sprawling one it doesn't get big it doesn't get crazy it sort of just sprawls on the ground and i don't know if you guys ever cut into aloe vera but it's very juicy and it has a lot of moisture in it and just the, just the way it grows you know if rain were to fall it has so many ways to get captured in there the plants that are around say you have a ground cover aloe vera and you have a tree in the middle the tree is, has this beautiful ground cover of, of succulent aloe vera that are re distributing water throughout the, throughout the ground. So, and plus they're very beautiful, so. We can use those leaves for as a nitrosamine. Yeah, as a, as a what? Nitrosamine. So if you put a, a leaf of aloe vera in a bucket of water and keep it overnight, it makes it one of the plants that's like giving a nitrosamine Oh yeah, there you go. So you can make like a little, like a tea out of it yeah, and then, yeah. and then water your plants with that. Okay. Another one is the agave. If you haven't seen an agave flower yet, it's amazing. Um, and you know, this, this, there's all different kinds of agaves and these are plants that you can, that people have at plant swaps, you know, or people have on their property and they, they produce pups. 
So I encourage you guys to, like I said, not rely on the nursery. Rely on your peer, on your your community. There's so many plant lovers out here. You know, there's so many plants on their property. Um, we should reach out to them and we should try to spread the love because we I we need. Just a small uh, ribbon. They attract almost every kind of pollinator there is. There you go. I mean, you can see why. Look at that. Yeah, I'm so much of it at my mom's house. I'm just throwing it away. Right. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> so there you go. I got that one. I got that one. And then my father-in-law, uh, he just uh, threw away some of the cool ones. And, yeah. wow. and I threw away some of the yellow and green ones at my mom's. Wow. Oh, my goodness. But they're still there. She just threw me in a pile of water or something. Yeah. I, I, I that that yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you got to remember that. Um, it may seem strange to have these desert, you know, these are like known to be in desert environments in Florida, because we, most people picture Florida as a rainy state, but you gotta remember that we, our dry season is so intense. It's easy to forget when it's September and it's soggy and just mosquitoes and you're just so fed up with the water. It's easy to forget that we can get bone dry. So let's never forget that because Plus the sand is such great drainage. It drains. When it drains in the summer, it drains. Exactly that. And that's why we need to hold, as counterintuitive as it sounds, since we live in a swamp pretty much, we need to hold that water in. And eventually it, it's going to leave no matter what because we have sandy soils and it drains. But we don't want it to leave immediately. We want it to be used by the plants and then leave. Let me ask you something. Does Um, I'm sure I have. I couldn't tell you exactly what it is. Yeah, yeah it makes it slightly more acidic, uh -huh. especially if they say if you get the uh, it's like fermented mulch, if you have a huge pile, they dig it. Yeah, dig it from the, the bottom. They get it out of the bottom. Yeah, it's like almost soil. It. Yeah. It's got more of a that's, yeah. That's got a higher. It's kind of like anaerobic. Yeah, it's got a lower. Yeah. Right, pine is best. Okay, and then one of my favorites, which I also brought seeds of, thankfully, is moringa. This one is a game changer for us here in Florida, especially on the on the on the um, like sites like you're there, where it's where it drains a little bit too good, and it could be too dry in a dry season. So moringa has this uh, very interesting tap root that acts as a little water storage, a little water tank here. So this is a little baby moringa. Imagine a moringa like this. Imagine what that tap root looks like. This big, huge water, water <coughs> reservoir. Now imagine if you had 50 moringas in your property. Imagine uh, if you have a big enough property. I use moringas, I plant moringas every inch I plant a seed. Every couple inches I'm planting moringa seeds <laughs> everywhere. I buy both moringa seeds, tons of moringa seeds, so that I can put them everywhere. If you go to the nursery and buy a moringa tree, it's gonna cost you what, 10, 20 bucks? 30 bucks? You can buy hundreds, if not thousands of seeds for 30 bucks. Hundreds of seeds, probably. I can go out of moringa. Yeah, so. And you can grow them from cuttings. And you can, grow exactly. And this is why that list, I'm putting things on the list that you can, that grow from cuttings, or that you can get from seeds as well. And it's just, it, it adapted to, it's from a drier environment, right? So it, it adapted to that kind of environment. So it goes dormant in the winter because that's the dry season. It doesn't have to go through the extra work of keeping things green. So you don't have to water Moringa because it, it, it's got it covered. It knows what to do. Um, so if you use Moringa as a tree, a nursery tree, and then plant other trees around it that you really actually want, then you have a, a lot less watering needs for the other trees because you have the mama moringa up top sheltering everybody. Yeah, and the shade is called dancing shade. Anything can survive under that dancing shade. Dancing shade? Yeah, it, it, so the shade of the moringa is called dancing shade. Oh, wow. So it's kind of... It yeah, because it moves... Yeah, 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 it's very frilly. Sure everything is... Ah, there you go. That's beautiful. I actually like that a lot. The, uh, the cuttings don't produce a taproot. Only the... Only the, from a seed. There you go. Well, all the more reason to plant from seed. Another one that I really like that inspired 
uh, Marianne inspired me, is a bromeliad. Um, I really, I uh, had originally put, um, I, could, I could sometimes be a little bit too much of a practical person and lose sight of the aesthetic and beauty. Um, so I kind of put off bromeliads as just like, ah, oh, it's just an ornamental plant. Like, I'm not, I'm focused on food and this and that and third. It wasn't until I went to your property and saw the function of bromeliads and how well they just, again, look at that design for water catching. How many times have you been to a bromeliad and see little frogs in them? A lot. Yes. All right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, then that's where... I just want to add that, that when um, I've noticed that when somebody new moves in to the, a neighborhood and they're not from here, you'll 99% find that all the bromeliads will end up on, on the road to the garbage because they have absolutely no idea what they are. <laughs> yeah. well, there you go. There's a so, pro tip. This is a house for sale and someone yeah. moving in there, you say, wait a minute, <laughs> can I have them? Cause yeah. They're, they're going to they're gonna get rid of them. Yeah. Marianne's like a, a bromeliad... Uh, um, well, it was the first thing that I saw, there, yeah. and I said, well, this is easy. You don't really have to dig a hole and get too fussy with it. You just yeah. kind of put it down and kind of ignore it and let nature take its course. Now, Daniela does bring up a good point, though. Um, the water cat, and this is something that, I, this is something that uh, I wanted to talk about, so thank you for saying that. Water catchment means having water during the dry season. We don't really need that much water during the wet season, right? Um, so what I do is I call it my winter mode and my summer mode. In winter, say we're in the northern climate, what do we have? It's cold, right? So we have a lot of layers on us to keep us warm. But in the summertime, we shed those layers because it's too hot and we keep it, we need some airflow, right? So the same for your landscape. In my food forest, during the winter time, I don't touch anything. I let it grow wild because we get occasional frosts and we get really dry and we get windy. It can get really, really windy during our dry season. And those three things are not good for plants. It will kill plants, a lot of them. And if you're not up on your watering, then you're there. That's that's. It's hard to keep up on the watering if you have if you don't have huge amounts of vegetation sheltering the rest of your plants, right? But when the when the dry season ends and we start raining big time, if I were to keep it there, it will be a mosquito paradise for them, not for me. And and sometimes it is, and that's that's one of the drawbacks of of having so much diversity is. You know, mosquitoes are a part of, of nature and they're definitely out when the, when, when the system is, is big and pumping and beautiful and lush. Um, so something to do, something to take note of is that something that I do, and you guys can do this in your own ways, but because my system is so incredibly diverse and there's a lot going on, I cut things back big time. The things that I don't really need, you know, I'm not going to cut my grafted mango tree that I spent a lot of money on. But everything else, I, I do a big, big haircut. And I just, I open up everything. So then all that biomass goes to the ground and just mulches everything. Um, and then it helps the airflow and it helps the mosquitoes. Like there's not as many, as many mosquitoes. Um, so maybe you consider a snipping your bromeliads all the way to the, only the new leaves so that you're not holding as much water during the dry season. I mean, during the rain, rainy season. But then during the dry season, you let them be. Maybe you clean them up, you know, because bromeliads, after a while, they start to get a little bit um, intense. You know, they're, the patches are get kind of big and they're sharp, you know, so you wanna, oh, yes. you always wanna upkeep these plants. Beware, yes. And the more you upkeep, the more mulch you're dropping onto the ground. You see what I'm saying? The more you clean, the more you're, you're giving back to the soil, which is also very critical. Um, bananas are probably, my favorite way of putting moisture back into. So, Lily, you guys saw this firsthand. <laughs> so I utilize bananas as my main source of irrigation. As you can see, I guess in, other, in certain countries, people drink uh, banana stem water. 
I haven't done it myself. Um, has anybody here done this? What is that again? Bana the banana stem water, like the water that's inside uh -huh. the banana stem. Um, okay, so but just so you can see, there's plenty of water, plenty of water in there. So in these trunks here, these pseudo stems, there is a lot of water. So bananas, they can absorb. That's the reason why they can take so much water, is because they they go right. It just goes right up into the into the body right here. So I, this is um this is a picture in Brazil, um, kind of showcasing. <clears throat> the style of farming that I do, which is called syntropic farming. Is it? it? It's called syntropic. Syntropic. S y n t r o p i c. It's a methodology that's uh, been developing in Brazil and slowly but surely spreading across the world, um, where they utilize uh, uh, plants like banana. Pretty much everything I'm explaining, they're kind of doing. Um, but they really, really focus on bananas because. Um, just look at that. Look at all those banana trunks. So what you do is you you cut these banana logs and then you slice them in half and then you turn them down. And what that does is creates like a little micro drip irrigation over time. And then the little critters, the other pods, they live underneath them. You remember, you guys saw, I pulled the, I pulled the banana log up and there was like seven millipedes and there was this millipede poop. It was just black. It was a black mat of soil fertility. So, and it was, and it was wet under there. It's, it's been a dry season for, seems like forever now. If I can reach under one of those banana logs, I can squeeze it and water is coming out. So bananas are probably the best bang for your buck if you're gonna go um, trying to uh, irrigate without using your well. Because especially if you do it in the precise way, um, the centropic way, you you can you can hold a lot of water th through that and then it's the same thing i was saying before you're cleaning up the banana patch so one of the things about banana patches is that they become a patch they become a little wild if you're not up on the upkeep then they're kind of going to get out of hand and then they get smelly and then it's just it become it can become a mess so be wary of bananas i am outside working literally all the time so I kind of can get away with planting a lot of these different things, but um, I wouldn't recommend planting too much craziness. Um, start slow, start basic, and then work your way up. And now you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I come in. Another, another one. So as you can see, I've been, I've been going more towards things that need more water. So I started off with the more cactus and succulents, and now I'm going, these are things that you can plant that you'll start seeing return after one rainy season, okay? So there's a lot of cool uh, uh, gingers and heliconias and turmerics, whether they're or ornamental or medicinal. Most of the time, things that are ornamental are also medicinal in some way. Um, so I think this is a shell ginger here, which create an amazing map of ginger. And the same deal, I use these indiscriminately. I chop them, I, I use them as mulch because they grow you know, without you need to try them, right? And the turmeric, obviously, I, I'm a turmeric farmer, so I have turmeric everywhere. Um, sometimes, for the little nubs and pieces that um, are too small to plant, I'll just put them in random places and they'll come up and I'll use that as a, uh, as a fertilizer for other plants. Um, elephant ears, this is another uh, from your guys' property, that I, another lesson I learned. These are also very easy to get. Um, if you look around hard enough and ask friends, you, you could find some elephant ears. And, I mean, just look at that shade that it produces. Um, and if, if anybody wants some, let me know. Right. There you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And if you need an edible version of it, taro. Yeah, and you can get taro, which is an edible yeah. version. So this is another one that, um, and, and um, this is another one that needs it. The rainy season to get it going, and then it'll it'll kind of uh. So yes, yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, in my eyes, that's a very good thing. Um, I'll be happy if that happens to me. It looks um, like. But yeah, that's why you take these things into consideration. Everyone's everyone has different. You know, I'm outside all the time, so that I'm fine with that. But. You gotta be careful, you know. If you know you, if you know you don't want that, then maybe don't plant it. Or plant it close to your house, so that you can be like, okay, this is a bit too much. 
uh, and you yank it out, you take it all out, and then what's left is this nice, rich soil because that, those elephant ears have been working that soil for years, you know? And millions of seedlings. And millions of seedlings, so yeah. <laughs> take that all out, and then you have a, a nice place to plant something else in. And they grow in swampy areas. And they grow in swampy areas, so if you so want... You can do an yeah, if you want to... They grow anywhere. But yes, as just be cautious with a lot of these plants because this is Florida. Things grow here. All it takes is one rainy season and things will grow. So, you know, please just don't try to go out and get all these plants and they go, well, I mean, I would do this. But just be very cautious and, and, and keep an eye on these plants because they may end up somewhere you don't want them to be. And another amazing, amazing, amazing... Um, tool in this toolkit are grasses, specifically clump clumping grasses. Um, so think sugarcane, think bamboo, clumping bamboo, you don't want running bamboo. This is, a, this is on my property, this is napier grass is what I use um, as, a, as, a, as a privacy hedge, as a windbreak. Um, and talk about roots in the ground, this is vetiver grass. People use this all over the world for erosion control, yeah. as you can see, <laughs> lemongrass. I mean, I had that in my property when I was in North Carolina. So we used it on a slope to yeah, kind of keep the soil exactly, intact. Exactly. If you have a fruit tree on a uh, slopey area, just plant these. Exactly. They'll keep out living close. There you go. Yeah. So yeah. vetiver yeah. grass is a very, very, very good one. What you get? Yeah. Vetiver, yeah. Where can I get that? I ordered it online. I got a couple <laughs> of bumps. And there you go. Propagated. Yeah. I know Shelly, uh, Heart of Palms Ranch, has it in Buckingham. Can they get tea out of that herd? Yeah, I think you. I think the roots are used too. Yeah, like in Haiti, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, they're used as fragrance. Yeah, yeah, they're used as a fragrance. Yeah. I don't know. You gotta experiment and get back to me <laughs> again. So, so either way, they, I really like grasses because they grow. The reason why grasses are so prolific is because they have the most optimized photosynthesis the way their leaves are. They grow the f very, very fast. So if you need quick shade, um, try growing some, some sugar cane or some, or some, uh, some napier grass, which I have tons of my property. Again, be careful. I'm saying all this, uh, but be mindful that these plants can spread. Um, so if you have a small property, just be careful. Um, so do you have plant roots from seeds? No, from cuttings. All these are, all these, that are coming up that I've been showing, you can either plant from cuttings or from uh, from suckers, from babies. Mexican sunflower is another ideal choice. It grows very fast, um, and they're beautiful. And you can grow them from cuttings. Again, be careful with them. They could uh, they could spread. Yeah, but I always keep a machete on hand. Again, I'm I'm a little bit obsessed with this, so I go a little crazy. If you do a chop and drop of this and aloe vera together, you have full NPK with all the micronutrients exactly, and exactly. Needed. Yeah, so Mexican sunflower for the nitrogen, the grass for the carbon, and then two of them together are match made in heaven. Yeah. So all that, I went through all those plants to encourage you guys to, to go out there and look for plants and just plant them randomly. Um, maybe not too much because you don't, you don't want things to overtake. It's according to what you want. But either way, those plants are going to collect morning dew. And this, this is probably the biggest, like we went back to with the, with the cactus, or with, uh, yeah, with the cactus. We need to collect as much morning dew as possible because that's the only way we can get through our dry season. Because that's the only water that we have available to us in the dry season is through the morning dew. So if we have a, a clear lot with three of your favorite mango trees and nothing else, there's not enough plant material there to harvest that morning dew. And we need every single drop that we can. Because guess what, that morning dew, some of it is gonna evaporate, but it's gonna fall. You ever been hiking in the forest in the morning and like you accidentally bump into a tree and then <laughs> And then you just get pummeled with water? That's because it collected all that morning dew and it just drips down over time. Um, so, yeah, dew is a major water source because dew forms more frequently than rain events. Dew helps plants to accelerate their metabolism and increase plant biomass. Dew also plays an essential role in regulating the inner water of plants and helps them activate photosynthesis rapidly. It also plays an indirect role in plant health by improving soil moisture condition. 
Dew drops on the soil surface decrease soil evaporation loss and mitigate soil water tension. Dew ultimately helps species survive drought conditions by reducing water stress and transpiration. So that is kind of the overarching theme I want to uh, leave you guys with is that we need to harvest as much morning dew as we possibly can. And that's why I leave my, uh, my food forest to go wild during the, during the dry season because um, you tell me, out of those two landscapes, which one's uh, holding more morning, morning dew? Oh, it's pretty simple, you know? And this is the same place eight months later. Wow. So it just goes to show, it doesn't take much time. It just takes one rainy season. And then you can, you know, some of the stuff goes dormant during the dry season, so it doesn't look like this during the dry season, but it looks, you know, it looks pretty similar. Um, so we need to capture as much rainwater as we can in the form of plants, in the form of mulch, in the form of uh, dew, because that's what's going to get us through the dry season. Um, so now I want to talk about learning your landscape. Utilizing the existing shapes and vegetation on your property to your advantage. Recognize where your high and low spots are. And those of you who, whose entire yard is a low spot, I'll get to you shortly, okay. Um, so what is this? This is the little drainage dish that we all have in our front yard, right? So what does that do? Water from, from you know, close to your house has a place to, 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 to drain to. In permaculture circles, people would call that a, a swale, something similar to a swale, right? So the county or the people who build your house are already doing you a favor by having a little water reservoir right in front of your house. And maybe many of you already have like a privacy hedge attached to it. So you have the roots already there, you know, helping to retain some of the water. So one of the first things I did when I got, when I moved back, uh, I was, I was ready to, to, to plant next to that soil. I planted where my drainage ditch is. And this is the result. I wish I had pictures of the other properties. Every single other property in that day, that day I made this video, their ditch was filled with water, except for mine. The Mexican sunflowers? Yeah, these are Mexican sunflowers, yep. Mexican sunflowers at the very edge. I have mulberries, moringas, wow. sweet potatoes, everything. And then I'm doing more turmeric. I'm expanding even more. So what does that mean? That means that the water that's shading out from the, you know, in Florida, all our houses are elevated. That means the water that's shading out has to stop here, trickle its way down, go through all the plant roots um, until it finally and eventually, this is like a microcosm of the water cycle. So imagine this is the Gulf of Mexico, and then this is, you know, all of Florida, and then this is this, you know, whatever, central Florida or rain. It's the same thing. It's just on the micro. It's one of the philosophies of Centropic is that the, everything that's in the micro is also in the macro. So you, you kind of want to model nature in any way that you can. So this is one of them. So the rain, the water, has to pass through all of this just to finally make it in there. And it was, it's, it was like night and day. Everybody's uh, dish was super full, and except for mine. It was only that much full. So what does, that, what does that mean? That means if we have another rain event, another harsh one the next, the next day, my property is ever so slightly more resilient because my drainage ditch is not yet filled. What, what happens if I make four of those right there? What happens if my entire property is, looks like this? Probably a lot less water is making it to the drainage ditch. So if we have crazy flood events, my property will be much more resilient to those flood events because of how much biomass, how much plant matter, how jungly it is there. So that's just one example. We all have drainage dishes in front of our house. We might as well use it as a free water reservoir right there. So you might as well take advantage of it. Um, so one thing that I really want to experiment with here in Florida, because we have a lot of wetland areas, are the chinampas or the floating oh. gardens. Oh, so chinampas. Anybody heard of chinampas before? Chinampas are an ancient, um, pretty sure it's Aztec, uh, agricultural system. So the Aztecs 
uh, made the city of Tenochtitlan, and in the middle of a lake, what is it, Texcoco? Yeah, I think it's like Texcoco. <clears throat> Why? Because it's a str strategic place to have a, um, a, a city, because if you're gonna get attacked, there's only a few ways to get to you. You can see at all angles, but it comes with some cost. How are you gonna feed your army and your people um, if, you just, if you live in the swamps? If you live on a lake, you know, it's not even a swamp, it's a literal lake. So necessity is the mother of invention. They created a system where they made artificial islands by overlapping, by uh, making like retaining walls. And each stick is a willow cutting, right? A willow tree. So you put, you make a wall out of willows and then they sprout and then mud and reed, they pack they pack uh, mud from the bottom of the lake. So this is something for the, for the wetland people here. Um, making your low spots lower and your high spots higher. Accentuating them so that you can actually grow things in your high spots. And this is exactly what they did. So, and they're still doing to this day, okay? The, the Chinampas of Xochimilco are still thriving. It just shows you the stands the test of time. How quickly have we messed up Florida? It didn't take as long as in a few generations. Meanwhile, the floating gardens, after thousands of years, are still here. Kevin, how, how, what supports, like, to show people on the dirt there? What's holding they, down? They, they dig, the, their, uh, they, like, dredge the bottom of the lake yeah. and put the, they, they put the soil on Is there a board for Yeah, there, there, there's like a, it's like a woven, I think it's a different reeds. Okay. It's different kinds of reeds right. interwoven with each other, uh, um, cool. and then making like a berm, like almost like a berm of just different organic material, wow. and then the roots. And once the roots establish, then eventually that's what. Um, but yeah, and I think they did it on the on the parts where they're just shallow. You know, it was in the more. Um, it's not like in the middle of the lake where it's very very deep. You know, it's in the spots that are. Yeah, it's in the spots that are not so deep. Um, so it's, a, it's an ingenious design that, like I said, it's still, oh, here we go, mud and manure. So they bought in manure as well from manuals and mud from somewhere. Um, and if you think about it, that's what we do today with, our, with the developments, you know? Um, we, we, we make tons of little drainage canals and, and lakes so that we can have the golf courses and the houses. And it's just, it's a, it's a very uh, classic way of dealing with, with uh, with wetlands. Um, and the cool thing about it is that every year, what I'm interested in is that every, every year, they, the only thing they have, they have to do to re-fertilize uh, is just dig the, the muck from the bottom. Because you know that's good stuff, right? It falls All down. The, it falls yeah. down too as they, they grow stuff. Like exactly. Like hydroponics. Yes, so um, here's another, just a fun little uh, kind of caricature like a little toy demonstration um so chinampa style system may be suited for our wetland areas and we'll never know until we try so this is what it looks like today a little bit more modern you know you got greenhouses you got canoes you got people you know there's it's a very touristy place people will take canoe trips there and you can see the floating garden of xochimilco what kind um, of food, Kevin, could you grow in that system? Anything. So, gee, I, I've seen, uh, there's a couple cool documentaries about the Chinampas, if you want to look at them. But they grow everything from, you know, fruit trees to um, corn, beans, you know, the staples of the Mesoamerican diet. And then veggies, you can grow anything. Wow. Because that nutrient-rich subsoil, that soil that's on the bottom, it just holds so much nutrients that you can actually grow, like, vegetables and things that are demanding. So it's really, really cool. Um, so <clears throat> this past year on June 4th, 2022, this is what happened to my property. Remember it was the first rains and the first rains are always some of the worst because, um, the soil has a hard time. It ha the water has a hard time infiltrating the soil. <clears throat> and I couldn't help but notice, wow, this kind of looks like the Chinampa system because I build everything super high because I'm a, um, I'm definitely an optimist, but I'm also 
slightly paranoid that um, <laughs> uh, about certain things. <laughs> so I, I prepare for the worst. Hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Let's put it that way. And I knew the flooding issue was going bad, and I, just like that water expert from Cape Coral, looked around and I'm like, oh boy, there's a lot of construction. Because I, I hadn't moved away from it for a couple years. Um, so the image I had of the building of the States, when I came back, it was a very different image, let's just say that. So <clears throat> I was a little bit worried, like, wow, this, uh, this is a lot of build, there's a lot of construction going on. Uh, that water is definitely not going to um, stay on that property. So we're gonna have some really intense hydrological effects in these next few years, um, especially as more people move in. So I designed for that. I built everything very high. And in retrospect, I should have gone even higher because though my land isn't extremely wetland, considered wetland, it isn't as dry as yours, but it isn't as wet as yours, Danielle. It's kind of like in the, in the middle. How much wind it is? Like, how much you raised? Um, on some places, it just depends on the place, you know? It was, let's just say it was a, um, a, a, a foot. A foot, okay. A foot and a half, let's just say, if we go to the highest spot, because there was still some flood damage and I went higher, mm -hmm. maybe like two feet. But then after the rainy season, it goes down some more. So I have to keep adding. But it was crazy. I was just, and you know, instead of a canoe, it, you know, you just need some rain boots to get through but but look everything that I, most of the things that i planted um sur i survived it, it it wasn't the avocados that i had which are notorious for not liking wet feet they were fine um they weren't too fine with the frost though uh, um you know and i have so much mexican sunflower everywhere so much bananas look at this banana this circle right here that i, that I had all the water was around it just like what we saw with the with social musical um, this one as well, and right here as well. The water, all the water collected in um, my pathways, and that's another thing to note. The water didn't, I wasn't mad at the water and wanted it to drain away from my property, right? The water could stay. I'm fine with the water, because guess what it's doing? That's percolating slowly through into the, aqua, into the groundwater, and instead of just leaving, it's able to stay for a little bit, and the plants, all the plants around there are able to use that, to tap into that over time, you know? And it's, it, it, it's just, it was just really cool. I was uh, really uh, blown away by how the system responded to that flood event. Um, and if, if that's possible with just hand tools, imagine what's possible with machinery, with uh, coordinated efforts, people um, not wasting money on pointless projects and trying new things maybe. We could do some cool things, I would assume. Um, so yeah, and here's another, a couple more landscape considerations. Concentrate your watering efforts one section at a time. I can't stress this enough. Try not to stretch yourself thin because you feel the need to plant all over your property. Focus on only one or two sections per season. Once those sections are established, move on to another section or two and keep it close to the first section. Remember the wood wide web. Keep those connections close. You don't want to, you know, it's so easy to have all these ideas like, oh, I want to have a bamboo hedge in the backyard and then in the front yard, I want this and that. You're just going to spread yourself thin and you're watering resources thin as well. One thing at a time and keep everything close and it builds on, the, it builds on itself. You know, the microclimate of the first section is going to help the establishment of the second section. And then the microclimate of the first and second section is going to help the establishment of the third and so on and so forth. Um, and take advantage of your existing microclimates. If you can, if easily accessible, plant underneath old pine trees, around cabbage palms. But now I'm not too sure about the whole cabbage palm thing. Definitely young cabbage palms I haven't had any issues with, but maybe old, old cabbage palms. I'm not sure. Um, but either way, the, the microclimate will help. And especially in terms of frost. I get a lot of frost damage in my house. If you plant close to a very old established forest, you have less chance of frost damage. Um, now let's talk about pruning, because this is another sort of oddball way that you can help plants um, by not like through, another way that you can help plants that isn't watering, right? So every time a plant is pruned, growth hormones called gibberellins are released, causing the plant to put out a flush of healthy new growth. 
Because of the wood wide web, these hormones are also released into nearby plants as well. We remember trees and plants have evolved with, with herbivores, deers. Think about monkeys swinging from tree to tree, breaking trees, you know, and eating leaves. So they need that stimulation. Trees are not just these things that just stay there and then just grow. They, they need to be interacted with. So pruning old, dead, and otherwise unnecessary branches off trees helps the trees focus their resources on more important areas like pruning branches and not, they're not wasting their resources on things that they don't need. So again, your watering efforts aren't needed as much if you keep plants pruned correctly. So one final before and after. This was the day I got probably, I think my mom sent me this picture because I was like scheming on what I wanted to do on the property. Um, couple, so this must have been a couple of days before I moved, finally moved back in February. And this is what it looks like now. After a year and a half, maybe like, yeah, I think a year and a half at this point. So again, I'll ask you this one more time. Which property, the same exact property, you see that big old pine tree in the back? You can see it back here too. Um, which property passes the water security test, you think? This one or this one? I'd say the second. Yeah. Why do they the snakes? Huh? The snakes? Oh, they help keep the rats away. Yeah, yeah but few of them have been there. Yeah, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. I've only seen black snakes. Yeah. The black snakes help keep the other dangerous ones away. Yeah, they are good. Uh-huh. But there is snakes. Though. I mean, I love wildlife. I love it. So um, I, I love the snakes. <laughs> um, but, you know, obviously people have different um, different feelings toward things. So, if, you know, if you don't want too many snakes, then don't go that crazy. But utilize the principles given. Um, and then this is just another two photos of all the principles put together. Um, and then obviously it's not just for looks and it's not just to hold water. You want to be growing food as well, right? So there you go. And another thing to note is that you're not just helping your property. You're helping the grand, the bigger watershed around you. So instead of that water flowing off into the canals and going to the ocean dirty, you're, you're able to help it trickle into the aquifers. So that was planting your water part of things. And I'm just gonna do a quick little run through with rainwater catchment. So you could just look up online on YouTube. There's plenty of things to, to, to watch. But the basic concept is you have uh, plumbing connecting from your downspout into a container of whatever you want. I personally prefer IBC totes, which I'll show you, but these are, these are pretty uh, universal, so it might be easier to find. Um, but the important part is that you have something connecting from your roof to the tanks. You have it, um, you have it dark, either painted black or like one of these blue ones so that algae doesn't grow into the water. You have, um, you have some sort of plumbing that connects to them here. Uh, and then so that when they when it fills they all fill at the same time I don't really like the designs where it's like one here and then one here and then one here. It's much better to connect them from the bottom so that they fill at the same time You have obviously somewhere for the water to go Whether it be a hose I like to put a uh, a tea connector here so you could wash you could fill up a bucket wash your hands or you could run a hose through it um, And then the very crucial part which uh, I don't have this part mastered I kind of um, messed up on my rainwater system, which is why I didn't take a picture of it. Um, you need to have a really good uh, overflow system. At least have somewhere where it's not just coming out of the top. You wanna have a, a functioning overflow, system, uh, overflow. And with the overflow, you can add it to, they're called mulch basins, like somewhere where you can send water to where it, it can get absorbed. Banana circles are another a good example put a big mulch pit and then plant bananas around it, you can send excess water to those because bananas love water. Um, and elevating the system is a must, especially if you wanna use gravity, like gravity for, for irrigation. As to put it as high as you possibly can. I put it on two cinder blocks and thought it was high enough, but over time it gets heavy and it sinks. So I, I need to re, uh, redo my, my water tank system. So here's another one like going all out. You can see they're all daisy chained together. 
Um, and you can see this little fancy overflow it actually goes under. That's, that's pretty fancy. I'm not that fancy, but um, I like this. This is my favorite style. The IBC totes, they're about 275, no, 275, 275 gallons. Um, and uh, so you can daisy chain this too and have tons of, you know, tons of water there. Um, this is not as elevated as I would like, uh, but you get the picture. And this is called a first flush diverter. My system has a, has a 55 gallon drum here instead of these pipes. So what that does is it, it flushes, it diverts the, the first flush so what happens is that things accumulate on your roof over time, over the dry season. Um, so think uh, bird poop, think pollen, think all these things. And then when it rains for the first time, all that gunk ends up in the first flush diverter here. So it doesn't spoil your, spoil your water too much. And obviously you wanna have filters as much as you can along the way. Depends on how fancy you wanna get. Um, so, and then the next size up are these kind of bigger, more industrial sort of, uh, they're made for this purpose. So you can buy them, they're a couple hundred bucks. I think the bigger ones are going to thousands as well. Uh, but you can see they, they come with the overflow ready to go. Um, I'm sure, I don't know how much, how many gallons they hold a lot, but it's pretty simple. You just connect your downspout to the rainwater, that's it. Um, but yeah, I think the key points are try to get it elevated, um, try to keep it close to your house because A, that's where your roof is and B, that, that's where the mound is for your house. Your house our houses are elevated. So um, here's a little uh, diagram showing it. You know, it's nice to have a screen right here so that leaves could stay up here and then another screen if you want. Your first flush diverter, your tank. Um, you have an outlet pipe for overflow. Um, insect screening is, is, is recommended as well, but you can really keep it basic. I keep it basic. Um, is there a way to keep the water from getting stagnant, like at the end of the dry season when it's not circulating or anything? Um, if you've got a lot in This is what I do. Yeah. Whenever we have an off, one of those off days uh, in the dry season where it look, where it's gonna rain, where they forecast rain, I'll use, I'll use my, my tank. I'll like open it and use it. So that all that water goes into the landscape and it kind of hydrates. Um, and I'm, I'm banking on it raining. If it doesn't, then that sucks. Um, but I don't do it all the time. I just do it. Yeah, exactly. So, but, but a good compromise is, is using some of it, you know, maybe being, cause you know, it, it's really, it's not a bad thing to water and then for it to rain. If you're, you're, water, you're like pre-watering it so that the soil could actually absorb the rain that's coming. You see what I'm saying? Um, now, what if you want to have um, some tanks at the back, back of your property where there's no roofs to catch from? Um, and assuming that you have a part of your uh, property that gets flooded or like a low spot or something, you know, at least on my property, there's a, there's like a hole in the back. I'm not sure if it was from the house construction or from, it was just um, pretty, that happens a lot, right? So we can utilize that to our advantage if we have that low spot. Uh, oh yeah, definitely, you're, I can definitely see that for sure. Um, this, is a, <clears throat> this is a bilge pump using boats. You could, you know, wire this, you could run an extension cord if you want and all the way to the back and wire it um, so that you can pump the water from that little reservoir in the, and during the, when it's rainy season, because a lot of the times those are seasonal ponds, right? They're only, have water in them for the for the rainy season and they kind of like dry out over time in the dry season so while it's still raining and while it's still full and while it's still clean you know sometimes um, it gets stagnant over time so take advantage of the of the time when it's like that first water and it's like nice and fresh um, you can you could stack a whole you can line up a whole bunch of those tanks here elevate them and then just use a either a, a regular electric pump um, or a bilge pump and I've seen people attach bilge pumps to solar panels. So they have a little solar panel system set up here, and then they wire it to the bilge pump. And you could, you know, it's not fast, but the bilge pump book could fill up all those tanks for you. Um, and, then, and then you have a couple of tanks full of water back there. Uh, eventually this will go down in the dry season, but then you'll still have those tanks 
to use for whatever purposes you need. Let's say it's on the back of your property or somewhere else where it's not close to your house. So that's another that's another um, uh, example. I, I'm not uh, there's I'm not too savvy with you know the you know, wiring thing, so I don't know. About three years ago, there was a diagram and a description of a a um, battery or a solar system fuel system for tanks. Okay. On the newsletter. So if you go on oh, the nice. Website and you can look, there you go. So and then and then you could and furthermore, you could even hook up a pump to those tanks if you want to use that water back there for something, you know. So. <laughs> Yeah, like he said. So, so that's that's an option as well. And then another option, and I, I, I checked the legalities of it, and I think the gray water systems are legal here in Florida. <coughs> Do you know of this? Gray water system, I believe so. Oh, yeah. The city of Naples has a large gray water system for their irrigation. Okay, exactly. They reclaim. Right? Yeah, it's just to reclaim water. So that's what essentially what gray water systems are for your household. You can reclaim the gray water that's used in your shower, your bathtub and your washing machines or other appliances, whatever. <clears throat> and um, it, some of them, most of them I think have some sort of basic filtering to go through, but you could also not, if you, you know, if you're just watering, like I said, if you, if you have that, um, your gray water go to just this big mulch pit full of uh, bananas and taros and all these different things that really don't mind impure water, they, they filter that stuff out. Then stick all that stuff, you know, it's, you're utilizing that water instead of it going, just leaving your landscape. Like, think about how many, how much water you use every time you wash your dishes, you take a shower, anything. All that water you can be recirculating back into your landscape. Um, so, and I've seen ones where it's like a DIY filter. They, they, they put, they make it go through charcoal and like pebbles. So you can get creative with the, uh, with the gray water systems. Um, I'm not well versed, like I would, talk to plumbers and I would like, yes? What about water from like whole house power rolls? That's another Okay, yeah, I was just gonna say, yep. Yeah, yeah that we was. Have, we have that. And... Yeah, so here's another description. So I was gonna put them here. Yeah, works for RO discharge water as well. Yeah, exactly. And I've heard it is very salt rich and it will spoil your plant so you can have to use it. Yeah, but you could water mulch okay. and have and have a biological activity going on. You can water, but like I said, bananas. Okay, but I would air for you know, I would air it on the side of caution and, and kind of just use it to use it as a way to just capture it, you know. And mulch basins are a big one, so this is a, a mulch basin right here. So the water you just direct it to this big pit of mulch, and if you don't have mulch, then grow bananas. Because the bananas will just suck that up, and then you can cut the bananas and use them for fertilizer, you know. Um, and like I said, plants are, are nature's filters, right? So that dirty water ends up getting filtered through the plant. So gray water systems are really cool. I really want to convert, uh, you know, our family's house to a gray water system one day. But these are just ideas that we can, you know, we can use in a, in a near term where uh, our water is still usable and not. Uh, the salt water hasn't intruded yet, so, um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Uh, I think that's it. I always end off my presentations with this image. There's a uh, two roads we can go by, you know. Um, a lot of modern society has been going down this road, um, but I really like this trail a lot better. So I'm gonna go down this one, and hopefully y'all can come join me and go. Down this beautiful road, um, and with some of the practices and things that I as described today, I think we could make the world look like this a little bit more again. So that's all. All righty, yeah. Thank you guys. Huh? Sure, yeah, I have it on the hard drive. Yeah. So I actually brought some uh, some seeds and some turmeric. Uh, if you guys. Want to buy some to uh, 
So I brought some jack beans and I brought some uh, moringa seeds. And I also brought some guanacaste seeds. Uh, guanacaste. 